Okay, we are now streaming live onto Facebook. So we are officially getting started. Welcome everybody to uh, PKD, Valis, and Practices of Ultra Metacognition with Richard Doyle of Penn State. And uh, Rich has been on with us before on Neura for a previous class in October. Uh, and that was kind of just a teaser for this. That was just saying yes to the new sphere. And uh, this class will be going for about seven weeks. So if you're watching this on Facebook, uh, I'm going to leave a few links in the comment section for you to just kind of sign into the class mailing list. From the class mailing list, you'll be able to access um, our class page, which has all of the downloads. It'll have the recordings. It'll have any kind of extra materials, which we will have for you. And um, any of the session notes too. So that's all going to be there. And there's also a comment section slash forum thread that you can comment on and leave your feedback on. So definitely recommend that you plug in there. Uh, this class is a free class, but uh, if you feel uh, capable of doing so, we really uh, appreciate and encourage donations, uh, which are also on the link. And uh, basically our dream for Nura is to produce and create as many fascinating, amazing, and interesting courses that explore the edges of consciousness um, through writers like Philip K. Dick and through amazing professors like Richard Doyle to come on and share their knowledge and their wisdom uh, to as many people as possible. So uh, your donation and your patron is, is much, uh, much appreciated. So yes, yeah, so I'm going to leave a link to that right here in the chat box and also on Facebook and yeah, so today is session one, and I just want to welcome you, Rich. Uh, welcome back to Nura, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jeremy. It's, I'm super excited. Um, it feels like it's already kind of started. We're sort of, you know, already like beginning in the middle, like a Tarantino film or something, you know, that the conversation already has been sort of, you know, activated and amplified in ways that I find really strengthening. Uh, the reason... I think that we're probably all doing this is that we we read books by writers such as Philip K. Dick and they make us do things. They fill us with language. They, they can kind of bubble up different kinds of experiences that we have not had in other domains. They're kind of like eerily familiar and yet uncannily strange at the same time. They're recognizably Phil Dickian. And one of the uh, characteristics, I think, um, that often occurs that doesn't get quite as much sort of attention, I think, in Dick's novels, uh, is this experience of uh, non-duality, where the uh, barrier, the ordinary relationship between a book and the reader is sort of perturbed, you know, and uh, that in being perturbed, the reader is then more or less coaxed, cajoled, forced, asked in no uncertain terms to look back at their own experience um, in terms of uh, uh, this, this sense of having been perturbed, right? You know, saying, what is going on here when I'm reading this book that it makes me feel this way? what kind of a being am I that I'm uh, uh, capable of experiencing this dissolution between my apparent boundary of myself and this novel, which I happen to be reading right now, which as PKD put it, you know, one falls into, he said, I think I've fallen into somebody else's novel. And I think one of the characteristics of a Philip K. Dick reading experience for a lot of people anyway, that is worth kind of noting because in being noted, we might be able to even experience it more fully and uh, um, you know reap its extraordinary fruits, which I found at least over the period of uh, reading these books intensely and kind of living with the um, experiences and the ideas and the questions that they offered me. Um, so that's all that you know that's that's happening is that this. I, I read these books. I, I, you know, I spend, you know, long bursts of time with the exegesis intensely, and then many days in which I don't. So there's a kind of, you know, I don't know, some some, some kind of practice is evolving with this, but it's a textual practice, and it seems to have these effects on me, um, where it makes me want to talk about um, sort of more refined menus for thinking about 
how to experience this non-duality. In other words, is it is this something totally uniquely specific to Philip K. Dick and his uh, kind of really, I think, shamanic word craft that he's capable of engaging in? Um, or is Dick actually in his own kind of wisdom pointing to a more general condition that is available to us through diverse means, but that for whatever reason, for us, uh, we seem to particularly hear it through uh, Philip K. Dick. So um, if I could, uh, Jeremy, get that uh, those notes up there, that would be um, helpful. And um, thank you. And while you do that, I wanted to um, start off with a quote that's right at the end of uh, one of PKD's really like more kind of powerful and sort of extraordinary works, I think personally, which is the Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge, which many of us who, who read this book find it to be almost uh, uniquely haunting and cathecting. You know, it sticks to you like an, you know, a, a squid from another uh, galaxy. So, uh, and it ends in, in a way that I wanted to begin with so that we could talk about what is this thing, ultra metacognition, and how does it perhaps give us an angle into uh, experiencing some of uh, PKD's texts in a way that are really um, enlivening and awakening uh, in their effects. Um, I'm even tempted to call them a kind of, you know, informatic yoga that PKD in his novels and his and the exegesis and the short stories and the essays kind of leads us to carry out experiments on our own consciousness that are akin to what the um, uh, great brain scientist John Lewis called Programming and Metaprogramming uh, the Human Biocomputer. In other words, that through PKD's works, we can engage in feedback loops with our own consciousness and explore the space of consciousness that he was exploring and in exploring it sort of occupy this experience or, or, or undergo welcome this experience of non-duality, which is, you know, has much to recommend it. Um, so the quote is at the uh, very end of the three sigma of Palmer Eldridge. And as Jeremy was saying before, you know, uh, nothing, you don't need to have read anything at all for today. And if you have uh, uh, questions, you know, when I'm done, uh, uh, discussing the first part of our presentation, let's just you know get to those. Is, is you know any anything uh, that you want to talk about in terms of uh, you know background for the comments that I'm making today? I I'm happy to fill them in. So but it's the end of Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge and um, Leo Bolero, who's you know uh, this remarkable character talking to uh, Felix Blau, uh, uh, police operative basically, and. Uh, okay, Felix Blau said, anything you say, Leo. So they're finishing. Leo, how come you keep calling me Leo? Sitting rigidly upright in his chair, supporting himself with both hands, Felix Blau regarded him imploringly. Think, Leo, for Christ's sakes, think. Right? So you can imagine him like using his, his, his face is contorted in some kind of, you know, mute terror because he's watching Leo Bolero forget that he has an identity. Oh yeah, sobered, he nodded, he felt chastened. Sorry, it was just a temporary slip. I know what you're referring to, I know what you're afraid of, but it didn't mean anything. He added, I'll keep thinking like you say, I won't forget again. He nodded solemnly, promising. The ship rushed on nearer and nearer Earth. So it's this idea of, I'll keep thinking like you say, I won't forget again. Or in other words, I'll remember to remember. That is maybe kind of the first place I would point to as an instance of ultra, what I think PKD is describing in the exegesis as ultra metacognition. And that, that ultra metacognition is the sort of recognition of the fact that while one is a being, the identity of that being is itself under question. So uh, I'm gonna try to fill that in a little bit by saying uh, it may be useful at this point then to think about PKD as one of a set a galaxy of writers, all of whom are in different ways trying to mobilize the ability to transmit this experience of non-duality. Um, so for example, the non-duality in Duandre's Dream of Electric Sheep, 
is in part the one between life and the machine. In other words, that the, the distinction and difference between a living system and a machinic one in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep and also, frankly, in Vallis become blurred. And in becoming blurred, we sort of experience the fact that that uh, alleged polarity or opposition is in fact, in reality, blurred. And the reason that it's blurred is because in reality, there are no objects, only processes and relations, but our imagination hypostasizes those into reified things. And that PKD is a brilliant teacher in always showing us how what appear to us as things that are persistent are actually undergoing extraordinary transformation. Sometimes that extraordinary transformation is entropic, as in Ubik, where things are kind of, you know, falling into disarray only to be overcome, you know, by an act of ultra metacognition, Ubik. Um, but sometimes they're also extraordinary and synchronistic, as in, you know, the case of Vallis, where, you know, it's what's being pointed to is some sort of larger scale structure in which we best not believe, but that we might very much experience as we read about uh, what uh, Philip K. Dick will write as Fat's quest for, quote, much needed objectivity, which would be another instance of metacognition as we'll fill it out. So these instances of me uh, metac ultra metacognition then are maybe best understood or at least well mapped through this idea of the perennial philosophy that uh, was comes from Aldous Huxley looking back at, for example, the German philosopher Leibniz. But it has these characteristics that I wanted to share with you and which I briefly discuss in the PDF that I shared with the course, which is the afterword to the exegesis. Um, and I'm offering that not because I really think any more pages need to be in the print volume of the exegesis, but because it can help to have a kind of um, distilled perspective on how to approach this massive text and how to approach the kind of um, extraordinary experiences you can have uh, reading Philip K. Dick novels. So the framework is as follows, and it has these bullet points here. And you know, when I can offer a bullet point, I'd love to be able to do that because it's so encapsulated. The first one is really very simple. It's that appearance is not reality is one of the characteristics of the perennial philosophy. And if you look at Dick's cosmology and cosmogony, a really remarkable distillation of the exegesis available online, you'll see that it starts off with, as for reality being a construct, dash, right? That that is the sort of premise of um, most of uh, uh, Dick's work <laughs> that the question what is real is not answered by the uh, what appears to be real. So appearance is not reality. And even better, bullet point two, the fact that appearance is not reality can be known directly through radical introspection and not merely deduced. In other words, we can not only guess at the fact that appearance is not reality, say through kind of interaction with geometry and seeing that no geometrical forms kind of exist in nature and the Euclidean sense, but in fractal sense, they do. So um, we, but, but, the, but the fact is that we can actually look at our own experience. We can get calm and we can look back at the nature of our own awareness and look for the source of our own awareness. And in doing that, in carrying out that sense of gnosis, then we can perceive that in fact, there is something more real perhaps about consciousness than there is about the sort of temporary manifestations of things in materiality, or at least that is a trope as it were, a pattern in the perennial philosophy. And it's something to be found in Philip K. D. Uh, uh, work. And it can be interesting to experiment with as an idea. You don't have to accept its truth value, only experiment with it provisionally this idea that we can actually know that appearance is not reality through, through acts of self-inspection or gnosis. Now, the good thing is, is that Dick's novels help kind of train us in these acts of self-inspection as we sort of watch ourselves reading his novels. We're already engaging in sort of metacognition when we read his novels because we're observing they're having these kind of uncanny effects on us even as we're reading the novel, right? So we're experiencing this fact that I'm reading the novel and I'm having this uncanny effect on me. And then the third move is to say, well, who is it that's having 
this uncanny experience, right? From PKD's perspective, let's say, is it horse lover fat that's having this experience? Is it, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bob Arctor? Is it Fred, right? This question of the identity of the experience is always a place where PKD goes in order to get us sort of beyond the uh, grip of the idea that appearance is reality. So um, we'll, we'll work with that, but basically it involves at, as using the act of using consciousness and using perception to actually look back and experiment with and observe your own uh, perception and awareness. And this is what John Lilly was doing in the flotation tank, but in a very interesting way, PKD's novels are somewhat analogous technologies, or at least that's been my experience. Um, the third bullet point is known directly it can be known that the self has two aspects. So once we take our awareness and experience this ultra metacognition and look back at the source of our own awareness, we become aware of the fact that there is this kind of local small self that is consumed with the problems of staying alive and narrating its own life to itself. Um, but then there's also this big self, which is no more your internal chattering voice than you are a headache. In other words, in, from the perspective of the big self, this internal chattering voice and the kind of, uh, you know, dramas and passions and struggles of, of everyday life are all, you know, sort of related to uh, as instances of this, in fact, this big self, right? So when my mind is telling me that, uh, you know, I'm no good and I need to, which, you know, it hardly ever does, but, you know, if it tells me something like, oh, there's something wrong with you, right? If it tells me there's something wrong with you for wanting to uh, engage these texts so so intensely and passionately, then I might mistake myself for that voice, right? I might think, oh, that's me saying that. But it's a very odd conflation because it's no more me than like when I have a headache, that's me, right? The headache is a symptom that comes and goes. The internal narrative of who I am comes and goes. And I think it's fair to say that PKD and his musings on uh, horse lover fat and his musings on the character Phil in Ballast, which is also often forgotten that there's the writer, Philip K. Dick, there's the character Phil, and then there's the character Horse Lover Fat, that these musings are experiments in this kind of back and forth movement between small self and big self. And that PKD's humor was, I think, often that he saw his small self from the perspective of the big self. Look at this tragic comedy that's happening. You know, of course, there's suffering, but there's also tremendous humor there. And I think that that's one of his real gifts that he uh, gives us. And then finally, that number four, the purpose in hum of human life, the narrative in which we play the starring role features the quest for knowledge of the divine ground. In other words, what we're up to here is this discovery of our big self uh, through our small self. And that therefore any techniques, the set of all possible techniques for engaging that quest become you know, beautiful, precious gifts that we have to sort of learn how to work with. And it would be, uh, it is my contention that um, Dick's novels in particular have been that kind of um, uh, useful programming and metaprogramming uh, software for my own experience. And that um, where that programming and metaprogramming goes to is the um, question of this experience, uh, you know, who it is um, who's having this experience. And when we do that, um, we can have something that's at the very, very much like at least a small e enlightenment experience. This is the distinction that uh, the um, researcher and physician Andrew Newberg draws between large e enlightenment and small e enlightenment. Small e, the, the enlightenments are kind of like aha moments. And frankly, if you have enough of those aha moments, then things get, whether things are capitalized or not, you don't really care about it, right? So that you can have this sort of uh, experience and that he uses these fictional, his fictional strategies, such as Leo Bolero's, you know, attempt to remember to remember. Uh, if you look in uh, Do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep, which I'll read from in a minute, you'll see that there is this kind of paradox early on that the only resolution of it is to inhabit this kind of space of non-duality. And then the third one is the much, quote unquote, much needed objectivity of uh, Phil observed, you know, fat having much needed objectivity on Phil, right? That he was a kind of invented alter ego in order to observe Phil. And then in the invention of the alter ego, 
and narrating the alter ego as a character within the novel, Dick was engaging himself in radical acts of ultra metacognition and that those are, can be made contagious um, by the text. So, you know, that's kind of what's coming out of me. I want to give you a couple of uh, definitions just to ground us because I know um, uh, this kind of framework can, is, is sometimes more useful than others, but I'm offering it. And so uh, just some definitions, metacognition, what we might call metacognition is observing an event of knowing. You can observe that you know you're reading this sentence right now. See, I just did it. You can do it too, right? You're just observing your own experience. You're just one kind of level of observational abstraction from it. Uh, and we can become quite good at that. In fact, we can, uh, um, through meditation, but other uh, techniques of focusing the attention. For example, you can uh, do chanting uh, either silently through japam or actually chanting out loud. And um, that puts you into this space where you're observing your own chanting. So that's a space of uh, ultra -metaco of metacognition. And then ultra metacognition, which you'll see in the afterward from the exegesis, I found in the exegesis itself, I think might be summed up as who knows that they're no that they're knowing they're reading this sentence right now. In other words, who is this who is the subject of the experience of reading this sentence right now? And to do that, we have to engage, we have to really look, we have to engage in uh, acts of radical introspection. Um, they might be something like the acts of radical introspection that seem to be occasioned uh, in PKD through the use of the, of the I Ching. Um, but there might be something distinctive about it too. And that's what I want to uh, uh, pursue in the class. I wanna look for patterns in these novels that teach us how to occupy this space um, of ultra metacognition and how we can uh, move from what the uh, other California sage, Franklin Merrill Wolf, uh, called the shift from a kind of point consciousness, an awareness of ourselves and experience of ourselves as occupying a point to an awareness of an experience of ourselves occupying a field. And that PKD's narrative about Vallis is can very much be seen as a useful um, experiment in and allegory about experiencing oneself as a distributed field rather than a single central point like location that we can expect that we can imagine ourselves that that's part of the interface that is available to us through consciousness that we can experience ourselves as a field rather than a point um, but that our reality and its infrastructure and the language that we use tends to be uh, associated with um, uh, point uh, consciousness rather than field consciousness. So that's a whole lot, but um, I think, uh, you know, we've got it recorded here. Um, I think there's a framework here to start having some uh, questions and answers, even if it's just to fill out details of, uh, things I've uh, only glanced at, but, you know, another bullet point I would add is just, these books are so much fun and so instructive and so pedagogical. We're being taught, you know, by a person that, who had extraordinary experiences, you know, and it was able to put those extraordinary experiences into kind of linguistic form that we can find contagious. So, um, I think we have an extraordinary opportunity here in order to do this all together because there feels like there's something different happening here, even that could happen in a classroom, which most of the time I favor. I love a small space where we can, you know, speak in, you know, deep dialogue and see each other's eyes and, you know, make the room resonate with our laughter and our, and, and our discussions and also our silences. But, for the topic of how to encounter the space of ultra metacognition that we might define as Vallis, uh, or at least I think P PKD suggests is Vallis, among other names, Firebright would be another name, Zebra would be another name, uh, then, you know, this medium is the best of all possible mediums we have arrived at uh, yet. And so uh, getting to explore um, the space of Vallis 
through this collective occurrence of the newosphere right now is just, you know, something that I think has been waiting to happen and, you know, is, is, is going to happen over and over again. So we have a lot to learn, a lot to uh, share. So maybe if we have some questions, we can go to that. And then if we pop out of the questions, we can go to God as consciousness without an object as an example of ultra metacognition. Awesome. So we do have a few interesting observations. I'm just going to stop sharing for a moment. Um, so one was actually from Tessa, and Tessa was mentioning that, um, if I can find the quote. Yeah, um, she's saying that when speaking about involution, Phil was okay. referring, referencing Derrida, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, Saucere? Saucere. Um, Saucere. Um, so she was just mentioning that to contextualize when you're mentioning that earlier. Thank and, you for that. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. I want to say also um, uh, would be, I think, Aurobindo is a great person who helps us uh, think about this, that, um, you know, again, it's instead of the outward focus into something that is other to you, it is the inward focus to the other that is within you, if that... <laughs> And that makes sense. The other that is trying to evolve, trying to be born uh, in you, that which is coming forth in you. But that's beautiful. Thank you. Mm. So somebody's asking, um, PKD, was, PKD was friends with a poet named Jack Spicer. Yes. Do you have any information about him, specifically anything in Spicer's work that was also in PKD's work? Oh, there's, the, there's a radio uh, reference in uh, somebody needs to Google it. Uh, I'm not, I, I haven't read Spicer for years, but he's always lurking there and he's a remarkable figure. And they shared an apartment right in Vancouver, I think. And uh, Spicer um, had this kind of also, I think uncanny relationship to sort of spontaneous languaging, you know, that when PKD is writing a hundred pages in a night, part of it is, you know, this experience of having the logos flow through you. Right. And uh, Spicer seemed to have had that. Um, I'm trying to think of the wonderful book. There's a professor at UC Santa Cruz who wrote a great little book, on, a great book on Spicer. Um, I can find it later and post, but Spicer, I would say read Spicer immediately. Um, that's it. That's, it sounds like it's calling to you. And that's what happens. You, you read a writer and then another writer calls you from inside that writer and you start to kind of have this whole um, wish fulfilling tree of writer helpers, you know, that help you, uh, you know, navigate the domains you're trying to find yourself through in, on your own quest for divine self-knowledge. So yeah, Spicer, man, that's, I'll, I think I'll probably remember the guy's name, but awesome book. Uh, the only other comment that might be good to mention right now, Dan was mentioning on metacognition that Dick uses a lot of internal dialogue in his writing. His characters and the reader are trying to figure out what's going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, the Perfect. character's consciousness figures in the reader's consciousness. So there's this kind of mutual bewilderment between you, the reader, and then the character going, what's going on? And then you going, what's going on? Yeah. Beautifully put, right? Like that, what, what Dick does, does is create these spaces between these holes in the narrative. We're, we're asked to take on their internal dialogue, basically, internal monologue. It becomes ours. And then suddenly there's a hole in it, right? Joe Chip can't get out of his apartment because he doesn't have a quarter, right? Uh, and you're kind of thrown into a crisis. And then the right, as Dan is putting it, the, the reader is also thrown into a crisis saying, well, how could he possibly need a quarter? to get out of his own apartment, you know, or how could it possibly be the space that both options in the Palmer Eldritch universe are wrong, right? He says both of which were wrong. So yeah, we're thrown into this crisis and both the characters and the internal dialogue of the reader, you're quite right, is disrupted. And it almost feels like the internal monologue of the reader actually disrupts the characters. Like, like it kind of feels like you're getting this, um, you know, telepath precog relationship with some of the characters as it's sort of narrated in uh, Ubik, for example. You feel like you're 
reading the minds of some of these characters because in fact you are it's because you're, you're you're laying it out for you know that's 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 a beautiful thing so that's ultra metacognition right there in a nutshell yeah uh, yeah that's a great way to put it it's, it's almost as if like when you you know that phrase that if you stare at a pot of water it won't boil it's like you feel like you're you as the observer reader is are participating in the novel and are somehow interfering with the characters being able to play out their drama you know without that kind of meta meta consciousness interfering but um it's, no it's you know what it's like um again another instance of ultra metacognition is um oh character in three stigmata of pound eldritch is eating uh choosy no no candy and um leaves a note to himself on the mirror to remind himself that he's on candy and that he shouldn't waste time you know arguing about things while he's in candy so the sort of note that you're sending yourself names that experience that you're do that you're having while you're reading pkd because you're saying like okay like remind me why this is all oh, right i'm reading a phil k dick novel you know you sort of like remind yourself that you're tripping on these words here and in reminding yourself that you're tripping on your words you're sort of intensifying your own attentional investment in the characters if that makes sense mm -hmm. and so you start to blur into those characters in interesting ways so um, we got one or one or two more notes um well, a quick one since yeah. you mentioned them uh lily and merle wolf were big in the 70s when i first really absorbed uh, pkd don is saying this but did phil know or reference lily oh you know i really think lily comes up in the uh exegesis um I'm not, I've not come across any uh, traces of them meeting each other, although it really wouldn't have been surprising. Um, like those, that those California circles were pretty tight, but there's a kind of Esalen strand there. And then the Santa Ana strand is distinct, but nonetheless, that's an interesting uh, question. Now, Franklin Merrill Wolf and Lily, of course, did know each other because Lily makes a pilgrimage to go see Franklin Merrill Wolf and says, you know what? Uh, Late in life, I'm reading this guy's work, and my hypothesis that we might just be noisy monkeys may be wrong, right? And he says, it may also be that F Franklin Merrill Wolf is overestimating his own simulations. And he says, but if, like the rest of us, but he said, but if so, perhaps there's nothing, be there's nothing better to do but to choose a better simulation than killing our neighbor because they don't share our simulation, right? So Louis, I think, is a kind of interesting perspective to take on Dick, because I feel like his ultra meta model of programming and metaprogramming the human biocomputer is almost kind of a descriptive framework that we could discover in it some of, if not all, of the techniques that PKD is uh, intuiting and unleashing in his books. You know that he's a kind of you know uh, intuits arrives at through you know through relentless writing and study and self inspection arise at these techniques, which are, you know, probably, and that's going to be one of the interesting things to look and see, can be found in programming and metaprogramming the human biocomputer. Mm -hmm. And it's a good Excellent. question. Why, yeah. why, is, why is PKD popular now, but Franklin Merrill Wolf and Lily are kind of unknown? I mean, it's a kind of interesting question because I think they're mutually illuminating, actually. Um, as we Agreed. Would yeah. Yeah. Um, so a quick one from Joe, Joseph. Uh, he's asking, did PKD attend Esalen? Not that I know of, no. That's what I'm saying. I think that there's, there's distinct paths there. But like, he was so close, you know? He, he was. It was so it's, it's kind, kind of, of a a frustrating. Kind of hard to imagine. Um, but, you know, that shows us that we're kind of like, you know, we're on our little independent path. But if somebody knows of something else, uh, something about that, do chime in. Like, that's part of what we have to have here is that yeah. the space of all possible things that can be known about this work is so enormous that we just need to ask, look, query, record. Tess is actually mentioning that Phil did consider going to Esalen, but he decided not to go. Tessa, oh, that's oh. really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Is there, can we ask if there's any kind of backstory about the nature of that decision? That's kind of interesting. That would be great to, to know. Because, um, you know, it, somebody also mentioned Orbindo here. I know we're kind of going uh, tangentially, but also equally fascinating. But um, 
Mike mentioned Aurobindo. He just linked to everybody. If you want to read about Aurobindo, the wiki page is there. But Aurobindo was an inspiration for Esalen, right? With Michael Murphy yes, exactly. and Integral Yoga and Involution. So here, here's yes. that whole strand right there. Um, but, there's, but there's a different vibe to the strands. That's why I'm interested to the thing. But, but there's strands that actually mutually illuminate each other. Um, and, I, and I know that, you know, for myself, like the first end times I worked with uh, Philip K. Dick's books and like they kind of like washed over me. I enjoyed the sort of, you know, panicky, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, anxiety provoking aspects, you know, paranoia provoking aspects uh, of the fiction. But what's interesting is, is that if we can, we can make the mistake and not see that that's a kind of like almost initial body load of the, of the work. Like if we were not using the analogy of a drug that it's like, okay, the first six times, maybe you, even you read it, you kind of feel the reverberations of some of the entropy that is uh, provoked in the book, but it's almost like it's training, you know, like training for a marathon or, for, you know, r riding a bicycle hundred miles, you know, you're, you're breaking through different characteristics toward then it starts to become, very illuminating, in fact, and that you don't have to be you don't have to be attached to the uh, kind of ang the, the angst that can come along with um, reading a PKD novel. That we can actually experience, you know, the light part of the the pink light, you know, and we can experience, um, you know, the good moments that uh, Bob Arthur has with his Ceph scope, right? You know that. We can metaprogram our, our awareness precisely because we're available to this metaprogramming. We can metaprogram our self-awareness into spaces that are far more conducive to our thriving than the kind of self-thwarting spaces, spaces that many of us, you know, find ourselves, you know, kind of in the cul-de-sac of periodically, right? So these are techniques for actually thriving. This isn't a uh, fundamentally a kind of intellectual, uh, conceptual game, I don't think. I think one of the pleasures that we get out of these texts is that we're, we're being taught how to um, experience our own lives differently through our interactions with these books. And again, I would suggest that it, it may be interesting to just you know think of it as a model. I, I approach the, all these things experimentally. What happens when we start thinking about Dick's novels as programming and metaprogramming experiences? You know? Of the human biocomputer that we are, do we experience the books differently? Um, so that would be kind of one of the hypotheses. Mm. So we're getting a, a flood of questions and, and comments, but I think it would be good to, uh, on the on the subject of metaprogramming, maybe switch back over. Drop to it, the, drop it to Lily. Good, yeah. Yes. Um, so can you uh, show me that uh, link for a minute, please? Gotcha. Uh, Thanks. Nice. Thank you. Here we go. Right. So. So this question of like if, if we if we practice reading PKD's novels and we reflect on the reading of those PKD novels as at least in part ways we have for altering our own consciousness, right? And to for doing so in a way that alters it uh, towards kind of self-thriving in a way in which we can maybe get out of our own ways in which the perennial philosophy has pointed to over and over again that we can lose our sense of localized self and we can sort of win a sense of being an expansive self. Um, and so that always raises the question which came up with Lily. And I think, um, you know, it would be interesting to reflect on the ex on what the exegesis might have to say about this. I think it came up with PKD is that, okay, so once I've discovered that I'm involved in this uh, feedback loop between the self metaprogramming I'm doing of my own awareness using language, for example, um, what should I metaprogram it towards, right? you know? And uh, that's where I thought I would um, read from the very beginning or near the very beginning of Dwayne Dream of Electric Sheep, um, where uh, the characters, uh, Iran and Rick are waking up in the morning through the um, quote unquote uh, merry little surge of electricity piped by automatic alarm from the mood organ beside his bed awakened Rick Deckard. So he's awakened by this uh, mood organ, which allows for the kind of alteration of consciousness that I'm actually talking about here that, uh, that I think Dick was very much up to uh, in his books. Um, 
and uh, they're arguing about how what setting because this would be a question is like okay we can meta program our own consciousness any way we like how should we meta program it and so it just they're having an argument about it. it says from the bedroom Iran's voice came I can't stand TV before breakfast right dial eight 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 Rick said as the set warmed the desire to watch TV no matter what's on it I think we've all experienced that. I don't feel like dialing anything at all now, Iran said. Then dial three, he said. I can't dial a setting that simulates, stimulates my cerebral cortex into wanting to dial. If I don't want to dial, I don't want to dial that most of all, because then I will want to dial, and wanting to dial right now is the most alien drive I can imagine, right? So this is the space where we get into a radical paradox when we start to occupy a point experience of consciousness rather than a field experience of consciousness we start to feel isolated we start to feel in kind of radical and unwinnable you know intolerable tragic comic uh, battle you know with those that we love and engaged in that battle then we're constantly trying to use for example technology in order to change the terms of that battle and to just make that battle maybe perhaps finally go away once and for all but the problem, the reason the battle doesn't go away once and for all is because the problem is our identification as an I, as a character, you know, that has, you know, this life story that goes along with it, that is coherent and has one characteristic. So hence Vallis, you know, which we'll be looking at in, in the course, becomes an interesting, you know, exercise by PKD in order to engage autobiography through a fictional character in order to sort of dislodge that sense of being simply a point, you know, consciousness, but it can at the very least be the observation of point consciousness and being the observation of the observation of point consciousness, he almost inevitably becomes a kind of field of consciousness and observer on all three of these characters, Phil, Horse Lover Fat and Phil K. Dick, the writer. So uh, this question of metaprogram towards one end would seem to uh, point to the idea that we metaprogram uh, ultimately towards the transcendence of the I itself, because it is at this problem of the I that I don't want to dial or I want to dial uh, that the paradoxes occur, right? So the problem is not um, the Penfield mood organ, right? The problem is that you know the uh, technology experience of being an I is the very thing uh, um, you know, that is the issue. And so um, PKD will write in Ballas, you know, that Fat said that I am not myself, you know, and he says, is, you know, that may be semantically meaningless. It may be semantically meaningless because it can't, a sentence can't really bear both having meaning in something and not having meaning in some, something. I am not myself. What are you then if you are not yourself? Um, but it's in fact our experience, I think, Vallis would argue that we experience the fact that uh, you know we we have no uh, one stable overarching self and are instead a field of awareness. We're not a point of awareness. We're a field of awareness with a set of competing narratives that occupy us and which we're able to observe and in fact debug through uh, acts of uh, ultra metacognition that we can sort of observe. Uh, our own experience in reading books such as those by Phil K. Dick, which we'll talk about in a minute, and in observing that uh, experience, we can at least momentarily uh, feel ourselves blur into a field awareness instead of being a point awareness. And we can become comfortable in that field awareness instead of finding it kind of to be uh, uh, you know, uncanny or extraordinary or disturbing. But in fact, it's that the, the, the fact that it feels uncanny is actually a sign of the fact that, you know, it's always available to us, that there is uh, some sort of um, buoyancy uh, that holds us up, that in fact, we live in a universe that is very much alive and self-aware, and that we're part of that self-aware uh, universe. So how do we get there? How do we get to the place where we can experience um, ourselves as a field consciousness a la Vallis? rather than a point consciousness. Well, again, we're going to be reading the uh, novels uh, of uh, Philip K. Dick, and we're gonna start next week, uh, two weeks from now, I guess, with um, Duane Ray's Dream of Electric Sheep. And I think it's worthwhile beginning, uh, beginning with that 
because we're probably tempted at this point to try to use our minds to figure out how we're going to experience ultra metacognition. But what's beautiful about Joe Android's Dream of Electric Sheep is, is that it teaches us kind of how to experience radical empathy. And it puts empathy front and center, not only as the content of the novel, but as the experience of the novel. It's a kind of training in recognizing and intensifying our own radical empathy. So I think empathy is a place where we can most readily perhaps experience that non-duality, right? We, the, the, the division and distinction between ourselves and another, you know, apparent other can momentarily disappear, dissolve, uh, or um, simply be non-relevant. And in that experience of uh, non-duality through empathy, then we can start to um, become comfortable dwelling in that state of non-duality. And when we're comfortable in dwelling in that state of non-duality, then the kind of uh, capacity to observe the uh, 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 metacognition, the experience of ultra metacognition can occur because you've already got this kind of foundation in the non-duality of the empathy. So you, you, you begin with compassion, you begin with empathy, and you get empathetic uh, with Dwayne Android's dream of electric sheep. Now, when we do that though, we may, for example, experience that empathy and we may at first imagine that on the other end of our empathy, as it were, there's some sort of other, you know, some self-contained other being that is somehow separate from us, even though we're, uh, you know, experiencing the fact that we have this deep connection. That's why we are feeling the empathy. That's why we're feeling compassion. And so um, Franklin Merrill Wolf's con uh, concept as of consciousness without an object is located as uh, by Lilly as a kind of um, technique for providing us with a framework for that experience of radical empathy. When we experience this total dissolution or, or even partial dissolution of the self into cosmos, into, into awareness, then you know uh, we can, as some not characters in some novels and Philip, uh, Philip K. Dix do, want to somehow bring that back, right? Somehow induce that again, and we'll, we can try to chase it and so forth. But this concept of God as consciousness without an object, at least for Lily, um, gives us this idea that, ah, you know, there's a kind of highest level of abstraction or what Franklin Merrill Wolf will call high indifference towards which we can uh, program, uh, we can metaprogram our awareness. And when we do that, it appears to be the most satisfying position of ultra metacognition that we can imagine because it go both avails us of the experience of empathy and oneness with all things, but it also experiences uh, itself as the observation of all of those things and does not identify with those things. So um, that space as God as consciousness without an object means that Franklin Merrill Wolf and Lily and PKD have left us, left us little recipes for how we can turn our mind towards our mind um, in order to systematically empty it of the ideas that we thought we had and letting it be in pure awareness without any kind of content whatsoever, which would be you know, an interesting hypothesis to reflect on. Maybe that's where Horst Leverfat goes when he disappears in Vallis, that he kind of ceases to be an egoic construct and is in fact you know, nothing but consciousness without an object. Um, experienced by the reader. Um, so God is conscious without an object is a link that's on there. I would suggest it's a good read. It's very short. We're thankful to deoxy.org. They've been hosting it for many years. Like all the kind of radically distributed resources on the interwebs that go back very far, you know, kind of this strand of culture was right out in front and representing itself uh, on the, on the uh, interwebs long ago. And there's some old and good material out there that um, is deeply relevant to trying to have these experiences of ultra metacognition, non-duality, and uh, looking to Philip K. Dick's uh, novels as practice insane. So uh, last part before we um, uh, go to some more questions is that, there's, that, that it's important to remember that this perennial philosophy therefore takes many different forms. And that for many of us, PKD's writings uh, uh, might be our chosen avenue right now for how to um, 
get to this fourfold experience that Huxley lays out, right? Of appearance is not reality. It is possible to know that appearance is not reality and not just deduce it, that uh, when we know that appearance is not reality, we inspect ourselves and we see we have a large scale aspect and a, a small scale aspect and the larger scale abs, uh, aspect appears to experience uh, what PKD would call orthogonal time or experience out of time and space. And then the fourth thing is that the very uh, um, purpose of human life is to discover uh, this uh, radical act of self inspection or involution. So I always find that it's good to read, um, to let ourselves read texts alongside of each other, right? Because they have much to illuminate uh, in each other. So I wanted to suggest besides the, um, the lily and besides, if you can uh, find your way to it, some daily short readings in the exegesis itself, even chosen at random, that there's a kind of array of thinkers here um, that you could think about um, as illuminating what at least what I've tried to lay out in terms of ultra metacognition. Um, the first would be, you know, from the Tibetan Buddhist strand, and there are many such teachers, but Tolku Urjian Rinpoche, uh, he's written a two volume set called As It Is, which is a really remarkable uh, uh, series of books. And uh, essentially what they're describing through what um, Dogchen calls pointing out instructions is you know, a disciplined set of techniques for taking the awareness and turning it around in an act, uh, act of radical self-inspection and learning how to engage other practices in order to abide in that state in which the self-inspection leads to a kind of thoughtless state, right? Not a thoughtless state in which you don't care about anyone or anything, but a, a state in which there are no self-referential internal narratives going on in which more or less you're silent uh, in terms of there's no chattering monkey inside, but the ideas flow by and take on a life of their own. So Tolku Urji and Rinpoche's books, uh, I think are very lucid and uh, helpful. And I don't actually think there's a huge barrier to understanding them. They just have to be read slowly. Uh, and then my collaborator and friend, Gary Weber's website, which is linked, uh, his website is just such an encyclopedia of, in particular, the neuroscience of non-duality. So if you're interested in the kind of scientific side of how, you know, some of these um, uh, self-experiments can be tested in a different domain, his website, you can just go to the search, in, search box on his website and you can sort of, uh, you know, explore a lot of different frameworks that, again, I think are going to be helpful for understanding what occurs when you read a Philip K. Dick novel. Um, and then Franklin Merrill Wolf's uh, works, uh, which I've mentioned already, but I just wanted to redouble that is, a, you know, the Tibetans have this tradition of terma, which are kind of buried teachings, you know, which are only made available at later times. Um, but FMW's work are almost like terma, you know, suppressed teachings, which are hidden in plain sight, right? They're like, if you ever read your Edgar Allan Poe's purloined letter, there are purloined texts. It's right out there. For anybody to look at, incredibly lucid work written in English. And, uh, you know, so part of the global landscape. And he has, you know, a framework which is so extraordinarily lucid, at least in my own experience, that it illuminates what's happening in PKD's books and that PKD illuminates what's happening uh, in FMW's books because there's a certain kind of passion and humor in PKD that, like, Rain, you know, gives so much more light uh, to the context. So they illuminate each other. And then, you know, uh, there's a link to St. Teresa chapter 20 um, on the difference between union and rapture, where, uh, which I think would be a useful link to look at if you want to start to um, allow your mind to welcome, you know, what the exegesis is about and uh, how we can understand this idea of being kind of quote unquote nailed by information and putting that into the uh, mystical tradition that I think is appropriate to, uh, to it. And then of course, Zebrapedia, which is this now uh, burgeoning online site for uh, the digital copy of the mostly full Monty uh, of the exegesis, which has been kindly accorded to us by the Philip K. Dick estate uh, for safekeeping and for scholarly inquiry. So I encourage you to look at that because um, it's just so enormous and uh, you can sort of stumble upon little passages 
that become transforming and illuminate other parts of your reading. So I would really recommend that for kind of, uh, um, you know, guiding your inquiry. And it's where I came up with um, this uh, observation that PKD makes about his own vows experience as an act of ultra metacognition, uh, you know, that's going to at least for a while provided us with the framework for reading the novels. So again, welcoming any questions on that, but those are some resources. Those are some frameworks. Uh, those are some energies. Here we go. So we have a lot of questions <laughs> and a lot of comments, yeah. which is great. Um, good, good. So the let's see. We, we could just start right here with Dan's question. And Dan is asking, did Dick ever explicitly reject Freud? We can mm. remember 1966, yeah. rethink some of Freud on mm. dreams, but also takes up some fundamental relationship between self, specific desires, drives, and particular memories as real in a way that is difficult to reconcile with later novels and stories. Mm. That is a great question. You know, like one measure, I, I, I don't know that there's ever a rejection of it, but um, I think some of the skepticism that PKD had towards Marxism was not just political, that there was a kind of skepticism, a deep skepticism about some of the sort of uh, kind of more scientific, scientistic uh, models of human experience. Um, but like everybody else, you know, he was sort of soaking in Freudian tropes, you know, in that period of time. But I'm not thinking he, I, I'm again, Drawing on my machine learning paradigm, my brain of looking at the exegesis a lot. And like, again, I'll take this one into account. I'll look, look over my notes for next time. But I don't think Freud comes up very much, if at all. Uh, and I think it's interesting because, of course, Freud in his um, correspondence with the uh, great playwright, uh, playwright uh, Romain Roland, you know, Roland writes him and says, hey, you know, you might need to rethink this whole... Uh, you know, religious experiences, wish fulfillment idea, because I've been down here in India with this guy, Ramakrishna, and there's something happening, something occurs when he's there. I'm paraphrasing here. And this leads Freud to write back and say, well, you know, I can, I, I can, I can understand this hypothesis of the oceanic consciousness, what, you know, how it gets translated into English, but I myself really can't feel it, right? And so we have this um, kind of, I think, um, at least inadequacy from Freud's own point of view on being able to say much about sort of these extraordinary experiences, such as uh, the one that PKD did. Um, but, you know, Freud was an unbelievable, you know, master thinker and writer. So, you know, exploring the space of his ideas is endlessly fecund. But um, I don't recall that it was necessary for, you know, Dick to reject Freud. You know, I think, uh, I think it was more a case of Dick affirming the pre-Socratics, you know, uh, and uh, affirming uh, Spinoza, affirming Heidegger, affirming Burroughs. Interesting. All these people are kind of allies. Affirming Plotinus, affirming Shankara, right? And so I don't really, I don't think there was like a lot of rejection going on, you know, otherwise it wouldn't have been 9,000 pages, right? You know I mean? or, okay, more than 8,000. I like to say 9,000 just because I don't really know. We know that it's more than 8,000. Um, so Tessa was mentioning a little bit of uh, biography here. Uh, yes, Phil and Tessa is uh, Philip's uh, widow. Yes. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Tessa Dick is on with us tonight, and we're very happy to have her here with us, giving some very interesting biographical insights here. Uh, but she says, yes, uh, Phil rejected Freud and sided with Jung. And uh, as a child, he was sent to a Freudian psychiatrist, and he had a very negative experience. Ah, oh, yes. Fascinating, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Um, so we have another question, and I don't think... He ever did, but uh, Joseph is asking, did Philip K. Dick and William Irwin Thompson ever meet? Oh. I don't, I, that would have been an interesting encounter. Spiritually, probably, but uh, 
No, I, I you know, again, these, these are like, we, we could, we could ask Tessa, there's the set of all possible questions is so big. I never saw anything about William Ern Thompson in the Fullerton archives. Haven't seen anything about him that I've noticed in the exegesis and I would, because I'm a big fan. Terrence McKenna is in there. Um, Robert Anton Wilson, of course, is in there. And as I mentioned, you know, lots of Heidegger. Um, so I don't know, but that would be an interesting encounter. I think uh, maybe somebody needs to create a fictional dialogue between the two of them. Yeah, that would be, <laughs> wow, what, a, what an interesting idea, a fictional dialogue between the two. Yeah, for anybody who isn't aware, William R. Thomas is another one of these uh, consciousness scholars, very fascinating, still uh, living up in, I think, Massachusetts or Ma Maine. Portland, Maine, and uh, he wrote pretty uh, extensively on, on mythology and contemporary mythology and science fiction and the evolution of consciousness. So he loops right in with with here, and I'm not surprised that we got that question in, our, well, in this group. He would group. have been excellent, I would bet. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm pretty sure he did. Yeah. Or at least, he wrote about it in one of his early books, and I do rec I recommend it. It's called, I think, Edge of History, a classic oh. 1970s riff on the consciousness culture back then. Um, Oh, Tessa says we used to listen to McKenna on NPR. Yes. Wow. Yes. Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> I can still uh, remember the first time I heard Terrence McKenna's voice coming out of a radio, and it just kind of like shot across the room, and he just said something like, "Look, the mechanistic paradigm has had its turn. It's had two thousand years. It's time to give it up." And I was like, "My God, who's saying it?" Yes. <laughs> kind of oozing from the radio uh as it would say in uh radio free album Earth. <laughs> so this is from uh marson uh let's see let's see is it uh, i think it's more of a comment natural evolution of psychology science coming from freud to young in a natural way, like from Newton to Einstein. That's an interesting comment there, this kind of traje trajectory from kind of a fear of consciousness as something that is all pervasive, you know, mm -hmm. a kind of like tentative embrace of the psyche through Freud, which is quite mm -hmm. fascinating, mm -hmm. but trying to hold to the, the science, you know, the, tide, the black tide of occultism, as he described it, and Jung being kind of swept up by that tide and going into those depths and sort of opening that up for everybody. So yeah, that's a great, great descriptor, descriptor there, Marcin. And that's a great way of thinking about it as an evolutionary phenomenon so that nobody holds it against Freud, basically. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> like, even the way Tessa responded, she's like, he sided with Jung and like, that's always the way, you know, it's like, you, you know, it's just like, I'm on Jung's side, you know, um, but you know, in fact, there's, you know, and then, and then where is Wilhelm Reich in there, right? You know, uh, um, and, uh, you know, and then where is transpersonal psychology come out of that? Well, you know, we can, James Hillman and people like that are coming out of Jung, but, but there is that, there is that beautiful evolution of psychology. I, I like that analogy a lot. Yeah. Excellent. So, I mean, we got so many comments here. Uh, let's see, let's go with, uh, Mike is saying, can we suggest that PKD, cognizant or otherwise, was metaprogramming the eye to facilitate instances of ultra metacognition in his readers and himself, most likely? So I guess he's saying, like, can we kind of, is that this what we're that talking about? The algorithm that I'm suggesting that yeah. he more or less discovered how to do it with himself by being a fiction writer, um, who at a certain point writes about being a fiction writer but that he was such an astute kind of observer of his own consciousness that he was able to sort of bring those patterns over into his fiction and into the exegesis. And that in learning to metaprogram himself through language, he's modeling it for us. And that we can like by interacting with his works and kind of marking this metaprogramming aspect of the works, then yes, we can, uh, um, you know, at least experiment with replicating these experiences of ultra metacognition. So yes, that's a very beautiful distillation of what was trying to utter itself through me. Thanks. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great great question that distills the mm -hmm. the discussion tonight. Um, let's see. 
Okay, so that, that was from Mike, and I think you just reiterated it. Thank you. Okay, great, Mike, and thanks, Mobius, he says. Uh, all right, so this is an interesting kind of comment here from the Q&A box uh, from an anonymous viewer. Welcome, anonymous viewer. Uh, just curious, has the panelists or anyone here experienced the words in a book, for example, the exegesis change in a creepy kind of way when read at random to seemingly conform to one's immediate circumstances and private personal thoughts in a kind of uber synchronous way? If so, have you tried asking it questions that actually got responses? And have you had success in this both completely sober and completely sober states and intentionally altered states? <laughs> Thank you for that question. That's a good one. The answer to all of those questions is yes. And we're getting uh, lots of yeses in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and, and, and which to me is proof of concept for this kind of label. It's just a label of ultra metacognition that, um, you know, and, and one way to, again, parse it is non-conscious brain capable of, again, Gary Weber's blog, very good on this, capable of, uh, you know, dealing with about 60 bits per second. So answers to six yes or no questions all at the same time per second. The non-conscious mind is capable of processing 25 million bits per second. So insofar as the conscious mind gets out of the way of the non-conscious mind to sort of do that sort of processing, which is where the act of reading is taking place, then, you know, of course we can alter the text because the text is existing as entirely within our own consciousness and our own consciousness is uh, available to our own self-reflection and self-awareness and can be altered. I mean, it takes a lot of practice. You have to probably some sort of contemplative technique is necessary to go along with it so that you can learn how to focus your attention uh, appropriately um, or intensively enough. But, um, you know, absolutely, that's a very interesting, and I think one of the problems with the kind of dualism that comes in there then is that we start to have this experience that there is some other, uh, you know, that we're in dialogue with, which like, you know, Occam's razor, right, the principle of, uh, uh, you know, simplicity suggests that we can side with, you know, fat when he decides that he's, experienced nothing but the contents of his own mind right but wow isn't that extraordinary right what are our minds like we can move on from there that's not a necessary constraint to occupy but it can be a useful phase of saying like let me just experiment with the idea that all i'm experiencing when i see that text move around where i get answers and i can query it like an oracle all that's happening is i'm learning how to alter my own self-awareness and i'm interacting with my non-conscious mind similar to the way we use the I Ching to interact with our non-conscious mind and just work with that as an experimental protocol and then see what comes from that. Whereas it's very easy to sort of um, become alarmed, uh, disturbed, overly uh, you know, uh, invested in some particular form that this uh, you know, metaprogramming is taking. And this is why I think uh, uh, Lily's book, Simulations of God, from which that chapter, uh, um, God is Conscious Without an Object, is taken is a useful book because it's saying, hey, look, you know, we got a lot of meta programs here. Why don't you try out this meta program? Don't don't get all hung up on any one meta program, I think is part of the uh, part of the practice. Yeah, and speaking of practices, Tessa was also mentioning in the chat that um, uh, Philip practiced transcendental meditation. So I think you can know tell. That yeah. Yeah. I wonder uh, you know, if can we ask how uh, regular the the practice was? You know, like were there was it a kind of everyday thing? And I, I'm not policing it, but it's like it would be beautiful to be able to point to saying, well, hey, like of course this experience, like no wonder uh, to paraphrase Terence McKenna, I understand Philip K. Dick because if you spend spend long periods of time in meditative states, the the novels take on a certain pattern. <laughs> yeah, she says uh, almost every day. He yes! said he was take. He said he was taking naps. <laughs> <laughs> he may have been right, <laughs> but that is beautiful, right? So he had a daily meditative practice, right? I mean, wow, you know that is a beautiful part of the archive that is established there. Because um, does that not suggest if we want to reenact these practices of ultra metacognition, that we need to sort of reenact the sort of as Leary would put it, set and setting of how it occurred. And part of it, how, to, how it occurred was to quote, take naps, you know, 
every day to acquire some sort of contemplative meditative practice. Uh, it doesn't have to be TM, right? It probably doesn't need to be meditation, but it would. Be, I think it's the easiest thing that you can do and you don't have to pay anybody for it. You can just do it. Um, so that is, that is just, I'm so happy to have learned that. Yeah. I, I can't even, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, he, that he's, he's, he's pairing this deliberate emptying of the mind every day with, at least during the exegesis period, this kind of like fountain of ideas that are coming out of him, which I think, and I think that the two dynamics actually go hand in hand, you know, that if yeah. by, by periodically dissolving his eye, the, the, the font of the logos just goes forth. That's a really good observation. And I think, um, you know, we were mentioning Sri Aurobindo earlier and a lot of these mystics, not every mystic, but I think many mystical oriented individuals tend to be these, these fountain heads of writing or oration before before scribal cultures, but yes. still there's this kind of pouring forth of, of interpretation and hermeneutics and understanding and reinterpreting old, you know, especially in, in uh, Judeo, uh, the Abrahamic faiths, there's this kind of overflowing over interpretation of the former uh, revelations, right? Mm -hmm. In a whole new hypertext. And, and the same thing you can kind of say with contemporaries like Aurobindo, and Philip K. Dick with the exegesis. Um, you're, you're mentioning this. I think Eric Davis mentions this. There's a kind of information overload, a textual overload that just sort of, um, gosh, um, what did he say? He, he was joking while you guys were working on the exegesis that it was like you were you were feeling that you would come across more pages of the exegesis just like sprawled through Berkeley. You know, mm -hmm. I could just oh, yeah. kind of almost see that in a kind of mythological dream of just, Philip K. Dick's exegesis just like popping up in, in folders and binders and basements mm -hmm. and attics everywhere. Yep. yep. Yeah. And like the grasshopper lies heavy. And, uh, and it, uh, the book and, and that information overload, uh, like we might call it or overflow, right? It jams that eye that would try to make sense of the book and makes it side with Jung. If we can put it that way. In other words, like, uh, uh, it, it more or less insists that it have almost some kind of archetypical experience, right? Which is, which points to another instance of ultra metacognition uh, that you know we'll get to because Willy Denkmal in Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch, when he does his uh, uh, um, technique, he offers his techniques. He gives his treatment uh, to Barney Meyerson and his wife. Barney Marison, the first thing he realizes is that this is a hoax, right? This is, this, is, this is a scam. But it presents this paradox because he appears to have made some sort of evolutionary advance cognitively because he's perceiving that it was a scam, whereas before he did not. So somehow this, it's, it's, a, it's a fake fake, right? It's a scam that is real because he's actually able to experience this insight uh, on what Billy Denkmal uh, is offering him. And so I think that what happens is, is that, you know, we, we, we so overload our cognitive mind with a paradox like that. And it only has two things that it can do, basically. It can kind of like vibrate back and forth with the kind of, you know, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, yes, yes no. Which answer does this paradox have? Like, did he achieve an evolutionary insight? If so, then how, yes, that because he was able to perceive that it is a scam. But if he's able to perceive it as a scam, then he didn't have the evolutionary insight right so it's kind of liar's paradox sort of uh, so you can either go back and forth or you can just observe it as in fact barney marson does in that case and work along with leo valero towards the end of the novel to remember to remember right that like we can remember that in fact this localized ossified point consciousness of the eye is just one of the characters here and uh, has no more uh, and no less reality than Leo Bolero, right? And that we're no more that character than we are a headache and that we're capable uh, of uh, metaprogramming ourselves towards something far more extraordinary uh, and infinite. So this question, uh, speaking of infinite cognition, a question I have is, this is from Carrie, is, if zebra is omnipresently information, which is my understanding, 
then is this very discourse metacognitive slash ultra metacognitive on zebra's part? I find that prospect interesting. In other words, is zebra speaking through us right now? I think so. Yes. I mean, what, what else would be speaking? I mean, and, and this idea is very old in the sense that, so for example, the, the one set of rhetorical instructions that Jesus gives to his disciples, he says, you know, take note, when they bring me before the councils, they're going to arrest you. When they bring you before the councils, take no care or heed beforehand, uh, before, you know, don't, don't prepare, just, just open your mind, let, let go and show up in the councils. And he says, for it is not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit. Right. So in other words, the logos from PKD's perspective. And so meditating every day, engaging in other practices in order to let go of the hold that the uh, eye has, you know, allows this to sort of flow through us. And when it flows through us, we start to have this experience it's like, oh, wow, you know, who's having this thought, right? It, it doesn't appear to be this local self that's having this thought. This thought is informing the local thought. So then our mind tries to throw a map onto it. And it says, it's zebra, <laughs> or it's firebright, or it's valis, right? And, or it's God, or it's Yahweh, or it's Elohim, right? Or if it's, it's pure awareness itself. Um, and in doing that, it, it always feels the way in which any particular linguistic frame is beautiful, but it doesn't, it can't label it, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outflowing. So, so yes, I think one, one useful model and label that we could use to say what's speaking through us right now is zebra. And um, the reason I think we can say that is that, you know, I, 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 maybe I'm just stupid about, it. I think there's a lot of things that I'm really stupid about. I, like I enjoy observing those things. Um, but it's always struck me as strange that people doubt that we live in a conscious universe since we're conscious. We know that. And I. Oh, speaking of reality upturning, I think we just lost Rich for a moment. Yep. Okay. So this happened earlier at the beginning of the session, and I'm hoping we'll just pop back in in a moment. Sorry, folks. <laughs> that was quite sudden and reality perturbing, wasn't it? Uh, let's see if we can. Yeah, I'm reading some comments here uh, while we're waiting <laughs> for us wholesale, yes. Um, while I'm waiting for Rich to pop back in, I'll keep an eye out. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a good question to ask everybody. Has any, everybody checked out that Guardian article, I think it was? Uh, about how we're living in, Joseph is saying, how we're living in a uh, PKD's world much more than Huxley's or Orwell's. Uh, that was a very interesting article. If somebody could link to that, that would be great. Uh, definitely recommend checking that one out. Okay, let me just make sure. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. Oh, Boston Review, okay. Here we go, here's Rich. Pop you back in. Are you hearing me? Yep. Yeah, sorry about that. The computer just went blank around me. But <laughs> Strange. Off, uh, off to the phone adjunct. <laughs> yeah, well, it can distort reality for us wholesale, right? You know, that's it was Zebra, not, we not just... speaking through me. <laughs> that's what we were just joking that um the the lecture we were all kind of in this trance of listening and then whoop, it was gone yeah and zebra so, was like that's enough <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was just saying for everybody um if they had checked out the boston review article on uh that just came out have you read that one it was no. basically saying we live we live in uh, uh pkd's world not orwell's or huxley's which is mm -hmm. kind of interesting. I like to think of all of them as these yes. you know, important contributions. Maps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see if there's any. Well, part of my issue there is to, like when people say we live in PKD's world, a lot of times 
they're looking at some of the sort of darker, more Eldritchian aspect of Dick's work. And that's a beautiful part of the work, but it sets up these other aspects that are in fact, you know, all about the transcendence, you know, the experience of transcendence. And so, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to do, you know, in, in this, you know, webinar is just, you know, highlight that, intensify that, that like when we say Phil Dickian, I think sometimes we get a very, you know, kind of like nearly one dimensional perspective on his work. And, and I think it's deeper and richer, uh, you know, than that. As, as extraordinary as that effect is, um, I think it also points to other, you know, uh, experiences we can have with his work. Yeah. Um, so this is an interesting question from Dan. If you know this, uh, when did PKD first yeah. write about dreams as actual memories? Was it in any of his 1950s work? As actual memories. I don't know. You know, what would be interesting to look at is the very first thing he writes. And maybe Tessa has something to say here. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the what is real piece that I think he wrote when he was 16. Uh, to think about, you know, because that would be one of the first things that would come up is that, you know, the, the, the veracity and intensity of dreams are often, you know, kind of one of the first inklings we have that maybe appearance is not reality and that dreams have a certain kind of reality that is, you know, perhaps like different in magnitude even than the kind of reality of, uh, you know, waking life. Um, so, but I, again, this is like, there's just too many places to think about. I don't know. <laughs> Somebody else might have an answer. I had a dream that I had an answer. I don't know. <laughs> Interesting. Um, Kindred 93 is just making the observation. Isn't it more creepy or bizarre to consider slash realize that we slash I are living in our own world versus a PKD world, the Huxley world, the Disney, mm, the Disney mm, world. Mm, well said. Yes, exactly. And, 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 but that also more illuminating and liberating mm -hmm. because it, it means we discover, you know, the role that our own consciousness is playing in the, um, you know, fabrication of this world, that there's some uncanny link with the uh, thoughts we have about ourselves and the kind of uh, panics and joys that we experience as they get kind of mirrored out into the secondary reality of the material world, just as, you know, PKD is periodically convinced that, you know, he was somehow, you know, involved with the ouster of Richard Nixon, right? Which I think, yeah. You know, uh, this this um, this model, you know, suggest, does suggest that you know it's if we live in an infoscape and the infoscape only exists on the basis of the kind of awareness that is beholding it or consciousness that is conscious of it, then our our collective practice of you know how it is uh, that we imagine the world into being has an effect. There's a feedback loop between uh, what, you know, collectives of people, the way they think about the universe, uh, you know, manifests itself through bio in biological ways. That is what global warming is, is the manifestation of our attention in a very particular way around the kind of dissipation of heat energy in order to satisfy kind of needs that are had by the point consciousness. But the, the, the field consciousness doesn't seem to share all those needs. It seems to want to, as Lily put it, you know, minimize necessities on the planet side trip. You know, it's not really interested in the accumulation game as much. It's not really interested in the permanence game as much. So just dialing the knobs a little bit towards that is to me like that, that's going to the root of the pathology that, that is over, you know, that, that the pathologies that are occurring on the, on the planet is to go to the root of that, which is the place of where the conscious feedback loop happens. And we externalize these kind of like horrific, basically hellish images of being at odds with each other and battling each other and having machines that are battling each other that we're, you know, we're perturbing reality for you wholesale. We're, we're, we're bringing that, that reality into being.
but that the good news is, is that it's an inside job. We can uh, alter our own awareness internally and in altering our own awareness collectively, you know, feed, feed that into the system and the system appears to respond to that. It reminds <laughs> me of uh, what Bruno Latour says about the Anthropocene, right? That, that, or Gaia, he, he likes the word Gaia specifically that, you know, the, the sum total, and we were mentioning this, I think in our, in our private conversation, the sum total of human activity is creating this force of nature called climate change, which is in mm-hmm. turn us. So we're, we're manifesting this thing and the, the separation between us and nature has completely dissolved. And what we are left with is this humanity nature amalgamation Hybrid. where there, there, there's, it's a continuous loop where we can no longer distinguish. And therefore, therefore we are immensely empowered and also kind of um, overwhelmed by what we're manifesting. You know, but let's, of- but 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 it's a, but it's important to mention. You know what? Like most of the time, and, and I'd be interested if Latour actually said this, because most of the time, from these kind of uh, you know from academic quarters, that goes so far, but it never includes the fact that yes, climate change is one of the manifestations of our attention on the planet. You know what one of the other ones is? Conscious awareness. <laughs> that conscious that that that, that not only is. Um, the focus attention on the dissipation of heat energy, a geological biological force. So is the consciousness, which is a larger scale phenomenon than just the subset of it that is intent on finding fossil fuels and burning them as quickly as possible. Right. And consuming goods and services in order to keep the uh, point like consciousness, you know, uh, out of total agony of being a point like consciousness. So I feel like we're going to the root here, uh, and there's only one, one, one way to find out if it is, in fact, the root, which is to go there, practice this, reflect on it. And to me, that's what really turns the corner, not only on global climate change, but on this just kind of the, the deep sickness that I think we're, that we're experiencing at, you know, as a species about you know, collective depression, you know, epidemic of uh, you know, opiates, um, you know, massive suffering on a global scale, um, that if we go to the core of it, which is that I, right, that we can, that that is the nexus where the paradox has to be revol- resolved, right? That we get out of this negative feedback loop between consciousness and the planet. And, you know, we explore the space of all possible positive feedback loops between consciousness and the planet. Do you think that would be what, he was writing about in the exegesis when he was writing about the new sphere kind of coming online and, and the idea that the rational invading the irrational, like this is the moment where, you know, we kind of come to realize that we are authoring ourselves, you know? So what do we want to be instead of negatively, you know, what nightmare are we dreaming? It's like, what reality do we want to bring? Forward? Well, and I think he, had, I think he deserves a lot of credit for being kind of, a very, you know, people talk about how prophetic PKD was, but the Tagore letter, you know, which is in the uh, exegesis, which is his, you know, reflection on a possible kind of uh, Messiah that is living in uh, Sri Lanka, whose body is covered in burns because he's kind of exemplifying the suffering of the earth itself, not through climate change, but radioactive waste uh, being dumped in the oceans. But that kind of allegory that that dick is is forming there saying like we need to give this a character you know like his is his mind is is making the character tagori and that um you know that seeing that maybe the task of the noosphere was not only to like revel in the fact that we're kind of part of this collective vast active living intelligence system that are somehow sharing information with each other right but that um you know, there's a task, and the, the task is the healing of Gaia, right? The healing of the planet, you know, not, not in a kind of messianic sense, but just saying we have self-awareness, we need to look at the global systems with it, within which we're enmeshed, and we need to take countermeasures uh, to address those. We don't need to argue about who's to blame for it, who, who's causing it, and so forth. You know, Buckminster Fuller, this is Spaceship Earth, we've got a problem with the life support system, Let's engage in acts of ultra metacognition and fix it from the inside out. Hmm. 
So this is kind of a fun question from, uh, I can't read where it's from anymore, but <laughs> what if Dick's novels are becoming reality, not reality becoming PKD novels? <clears throat> what? One more time, what, which one of the novels are becoming reality, not? I think he's, he's kind of flipping it on its head because everyone says that, you know, reality is becoming. Um, oh, right. So he's saying what okay, Dick novels novel. are becoming reality and not reality becoming like the PKD novels. Is there any difference? Is that because well, that's a loop? Well, well, I think you feel the loop uh, better if you flip it in this way, because um, I, I think that, uh, you know, like the idea of living information and the homo plasmate in, uh, you know, Vallis, in the kind of Vallis discourse, would say that, you know, it would say like, yeah, you know, like Flat, or Terrence McKenna used to put it, language is loose on planet three, right? You know, these, these texts have been released out there and they're part of, you know, the sort of web of interrelating consciousness. And that's why it matters how we read them. <laughs> you know, like if, if, if we read them to manifest a uh, reality that is the sort of like darkly Manichaean Gnostic reality uh, that is available in there. Then we get, we seem to get the darkly Manichaean Gnostic reality where we can't really tell the difference between the machines and the humans, but the machines definitely win. Right. You know? Um, so uh, that, that's why, you know, there's a very, you know, there's, there's very interesting stakes in how we uh, approach these, these texts. Um, because I think that that's a, again, Occam's razor would suggest like, think about what would have to happen in order for reality to become a Philip K. Dick novel, as opposed to think about what would have to happen for a Philip K. Dick novel to be a side of seed crystal for a set of thought forms that made reality into the aspect of the Philip K. Dick novel, right? So bottom up, you know, it's like the, the novel is a kind of DNA for the world that comes into being. And it's not the only world. Of course, there's lots of other competing DNAs, but there's an evolutionary kind of, you know, battle going on in the meme space for kind of which reality is going to manifest. And that's happening all the time. And that has always been happening, but that there's a form of PKD's novels that are coming into reality in a way that is sort of uh, more recognizable maybe than other ways that his novels could come into reality. And th 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 those ways are the ways that I wanted to point to in terms of this um, practical, good humored, uh, sometimes panicky, but you know, always funny and always human transcendence. Quest for Transcendence. It's a great way to, to really summarize, distill Philip K. Dick's uh, person as, yeah. as, as a writer and, and what he was contributing. Um, so we're, we're at about 90 minutes, but I'm, I'm liking that we're kind of coming to, to the end of this session here, talking about sort of how PKD is concressing in the larger culture, which is probably why some of us are here um, mm -hmm. who hadn't really you know, who have been recently interested in PKD. So I know a lot of us are longtime readers here, but um, I've just been noticing there's been a few interesting people coming in, having, you know, read about Man in the High Castle, reading that article and, and that, um, the Boston Review and so on. So, yeah, I mean, that's sort of another meta level, right? And how and how the, the collective culture of, of the modern world and sort of the literary um, gatekeepers, as much as we can can call them gatekeepers anymore in the internet age, are sort of constructing Philip K. Dick and exactly. and remembering him as wait this guy this guy who we didn't pay attention to during the eighties and, and some of the nineties and maybe Hollywood did for fun but no this guy had something to say about our world mm -hmm. our time he mm -hmm. seemed to be. He seemed to be tapped in. He seemed to be remembering the future, as it were. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an interesting sociological moment, I think, right now, where so much, uh, so many different writers and thinkers are kind of going. There's he, this guy is helping us to translate our reality yes. as it is right now. He's giving us that map in which you know, okay, navigating alternative worlds, falling into dystopias, slipping into dystopias without even realizing it, which a lot of people feel these days is happening. Well, these kinds of things are somehow more prescient than we realized. And, you know, it, there was a kind of, there's a kind of latency in PKD's writing sociologically, which I find mm -hmm. really interesting. Mm -hmm. And now a reconstruction well of history that's like, 
this guy is actually telling us more than maybe even Huxley or Orwell, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. Um, well, and, yeah, and maybe prophetic. Maybe precisely because he's willing to go to the transcendent. You know, it's, it's his journey to the transcendent that make people want to disavow the exegesis or, you know, you know, the diagnoses uh, are legion. You know, I mean, like, you know, we, we could all be diagnosed. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, there's an endless taxonomy of things that we could be diagnosed with. And we all, we all have challenges. But I think that the depth that he went to to sort of explore these spaces is one of the reasons why he was feeling it, you know, early. You know, that he, he, was, he was feeling that inf information over. He was feeling what it meant to live in a universe that was being transformed into information, right? And he's yeah. feeling it, he was feeling it at the same time that Teilhard de Jardin was feeling it, but Teilhard was feeling it in a different but complementary way that then when PKD comes around to Teilhard in the exegesis, he says, oh, hey, wow, like I came up with the Noosphere totally independently of Teilhard. So they're kind of talking to each other, uh, even though I'm, you know, pretty sure they never met. Um, so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's much beauty there. So what I want to maybe uh, leave people with is this idea of like, okay, so let's read intensely do androids dream of electric sheep together in the next couple of weeks. And let's like share some fragments and so forth that we want to focus on. I'll do that. And let's, you know, see how, you know, what, what kind of reading gets manifested out of Dwandroid's Dream of Electric Sheep with this framework of programming and metaprogramming, the human biocomputer with this framework of ultra metacognition, and within these frameworks that, you know, have been coming up with these kind of feedback loops of, you know, the capacity to query your own mind and get answers, right? Um, so, and again, what's beautiful about that, and I think grounding for a beginning uh, of a course, is that really what it comes down to is you know, practicing and experiencing kind of radical empathy, you know, like observing our own capacity for em empathy, observing the way in which we can dial our, our own capacity uh, for empathy, the, the, noticing the way in which we can be empathetic. We can feel grateful, for example, on purpose. We can induce that experience of gratitude, which is conducive to, to entropy. So learning how to program the uh, meta program, the human biocomputer, alongside of that is interesting. And um, I think that as a collective experiment and how to read these texts is going to be very fruitful. Other, you know, this will be then left behind for other people to jump into, argue with, uh, uh, you know, uh, expand upon, you know, cut up and so forth. So this is, we're, we're not looking to even remotely establish the last word, you know, on PKD. We're looking to just explore this thread of ultra metacognition through his novels and maybe experience it with him. And in doing that, you know, I think at the very least, it's going to be radically interesting experiment in collective programming and metaprogramming a collective human biocomputer. Yeah. That's another level here that we're all joined <laughs> together <laughs> through the internet, thinking about these things very, as consciously as we can and, and doing this kind of collective experiment. So Thank you, everybody, for, yeah, the hive meld, Mike says. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating with us and getting started with us. And, and, and uh, thank so, you so much to Tessa for those, like, beautiful little insights that are now in the archives. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Tessa. And um, let's see, any other final comments here as we come to a close? <laughs> So to understand metaprogramming the human biocomputer, perhaps understand the language of the human body better than a medical, do a medical doctor yes. might. Ooh. Oh, well, in other words, the only way is to be able to reflect on our own embodiment and listen to that embodiment through whatever language that it's speaking to us. I mean, and this is where it can be very healing in the sense that we have this kind of external focus language of the, med of, of the medicalized body which can be useful for certain things, for manipulating it in certain ways. But in terms of healing ourselves, nobody can really do that for us. We have to do that from the inside out, in which case then if we're suffering some kind of physical challenges, we can work in alliance with medical doctors. But we, we have to first and foremost, you know, learn how to focus our own attention on ourselves so that we can even listen to, as, as the questioner was putting it, you know, the language that the body is speaking to us in already all the time, never mm -hmm. stopping. So 
uh, just to close, um, our homework assignment <laughs> is to read Do Android Stream of Electric Sheep. <laughs> uh, so For sure. Everybody knows. Uh, so grab a copy if you don't have one. There are links in the class portal and the two links I just sent you guys. Um, if you buy through Amazon, if you want to, you know, interface with the empire, um, we have an Amazon portal. So that some of that money will go back to Nura. And um, as always, you know, this is this is open access. So any contributions, speaking of empathy, any kind of mm-hmm. uh, contributions, whether it's just sharing this, getting the word out or you know, throwing four or five bucks in, cup of coffee. We really appreciate that. And, um, you know, thanks for making this possible, everybody, for your interest and for your support. So, yeah. And thank you, Rich, for joining us. I'm so, I'm so hyped up right now. Excited. <laughs> I'm gonna thank you for letting me share through. what was bubbling through me. Of course. Always. Mm. It's always a pleasure. And, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in either on Facebook or uh, on the webinar with us tonight. So we'll see you next week, next Monday at the same time, same um, hyperspace. Yes. Okay. So, right. Next week. Perfect. 730. I'm there. Do Andrew's Dream of Electric Sheep. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Jeremy. uh, Class Portal. Uh, Feel free to put your comments in there, everybody. Please do. Yeah, I'll be checking that out. And then will the recording be up there too? Or uh... Yes, yes. That's okay, all going to go up tomorrow on, on, the, on the page. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Thanks to everybody. Really appreciate it. Looking forward Bye, to looking at the chat.